the, the, the winning Bronco team was known as the laterally moving team, and they were really, really, really good. Um, anyway, but that's why the the foot is up when you're in Denver to walk right under it and take a picture of it directly up. So it'll center you. I've never introduced anybody in the middle of their talk. So. <laughs> uh, Dr. Robert T. Bucker, everybody. Now, I, it, it's usual for a, a speaker to thank the audience coming in. We do thank all of you. Uh, we wish the ratio of dogs to people was higher than <laughs> one to 275. That's a fine pooch. Um, this is a magical place. I saw the word Seymour Baylor, and Baylor County when I was in the fourth grade, the, my first trip to the Great Museum in uh, New York City. And there was a beautiful Dimetrodon, beautiful. And there was a um, Adaphosaurus, the plant eater with this, the fin, very beautiful. And there was this curious animal with a wide, flat face called Ophiacodon, also beautiful. And there was Ariox. There was Ariox, the great alligator-headed amphibian. And um, among other things that I told my parents was that I was going to grow up and go to Baylor County. Uh, and I finally, finally did. Um, I'm about to give you a, a short talk about why this place, Seymour, Baylor County, the Red Beds of Texas, in many ways are more important than any other slice of preserved geological history. Now, I really love Brontosaurus and its close skin Apatosaurus, and I've dug them. But if you're being philosophical, if you want to understand your own purpose in life, this place is more important. If you're a Lutheran, any Lutherans here? How many Lutherans? Seriously. Lutherans. How many people won't admit they're Lutherans? <laughs> There's a wonderful story, a true story, about a, a, Lutheran, a Lutheran who wanted to be a scientific pastor and teach in a Lutheran university, Carl Kreckler. Kreckler. His book is still out. And he fought with, and he sparred with more conservative Lutherans who, who said that, um, Fossils are um, the devil's devices to turn your, your attention away from the book of Leviticus. Now, I don't know how often you read the book of Leviticus. <laughs> it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, but anyway, Carl Krecker was um, enrolled in a secular college studying biology, which he was going to teach in a Lutheran college. And he ended up teaching in Valparaiso, which is known as the Harvard of Lutherans, um, where you can get um, casserole dishes with PhDs on them. <coughs> anyway, it was this place which calmed his soul. Carl was worried. He was disturbed, not so much about his own doubts of how creation occurred. It did occur, he was sure. But how did it occur? And did, did it change, did evolution change the form of animals, including humans, through time? And it was this place that calmed his fear for his whole life. He didn't visit here. He visited fossils from here. Shorty Olson, the great paleontologist in Chicago, was on his thesis committee. So Carl Krecker, graduate student, walks into the lab, and there are red bed specimens, hundreds of them, thousands of them, dug from around here. But more than that, there were red bed specimens dug from South Africa, representing a little later time. And he had a good eye for anatomy, and he could look at some of these South African animals, later Permian, and see how they were structural developments from Texas red beds animal. And uh, that course and the fossils he saw convinced him that there is such a thing as creation and there's a way it happened 
to natural selection and mutation. And the record is in the rocks, and the record is in the red beds. So anyway, and his uh, biography is online. He passed it as we were uh, a few years ago. And uh, when he was hired, one of the local conservative Lutheran pastors called the president of Valparaiso and said, you must fire this young faculty. He's teaching Darwinism. And if you don't fire him, my church will stop supporting your university. So the president of the University of Valparaiso was a smart guy, called downstairs to the financial officer saying, how much money has XXX church given the uh, university over the last, say, 10 years? And uh, two minutes later, the answer came back. Nothing. <laughs> zero. <laughs> they were threatening to cut off zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, this is a soothing place. This is a stimulating place. We are all uh, privileged to be here. It's uh, amazing how much wonderful work has gone on in the Whiteside Museum. There are animals there that are new, uh, new species. More important than that, there are better um, samples of animals that we've known for 100 years. There's not one, not two, not three, but five members of the Dimetrodon family there doing different things. It's like in certain parts of Africa, you can find a leopard, a cheetah, um, um, lions, um, big hyenas. You can find five big, pretty powerful, active predators. Back then, in the uh, early Permian, so it was here. Uh, I saw the word Seymour and Baylor in the label, I read, I read the label, that was red bed specimens in New York. They had come from here or nearby, collected for Professor Cope at Philadelphia and the American Museum bought his collection and curated it and cleaned it up more. And there's also a couple of folks who gave their life for Red Beds, Texas, paleontology. Jakob Ohl is another guy whom you should know, B-O-L-L, -L, Jakob Ohl, a Swiss-trained naturalist, field naturalist and physician, came down here to collect Red Beds fossils. He found the first dimensional skeleton nearly the whole thing, small species. And uh, anatomical drawings were made, and they made the front page all over the world. This thing with a fin and saber teeth, a predator, totally unknown group of critters from, from around here, Jacopo. He was in his um, collecting outfit a little east of here, and he had collected a wonderful Uriox, great big alligator, <coughs> headed amphibian. And, uh, it was nailed by a Texas rattlesnake, big one, Diamondback. He knew enough medicine that he knew he was going to die. And he sat down on his bunk and made sure that every single specimen had a label, careful label, well done, and wrapped them all up. And then um, self-medicated with some schnapps <laughs> and uh, uh, sat down and wrote a poem in German. And, all of these things, the labels, the fossils, um, the notes were found um, after he died the next morning, and his body eventually made it to the Texas um, Cemetery of Heroes near, near Dallas, Jacob Roll. And he was responsible for at least five new kinds of animals collected from around here, which he sent up to Professor Cope, who got his illustrator to show what they were like. So I hat off to Yagapo, uh, a great man. So this will change you to be in this. Uh, could you skip that? Go to the next slide. That's I like that one. Um, this, this talk is about how to philosophically, in your own mind, or teaching, or speaking, or just uh, ruminating, where to put our red beds and animals in the history of life and the purpose of life. This is a dimension from of earlier beds, from the Wichita beds, but similar to the guy you have, uh, writing a two-thirds grown Uriops in, um, in Al Romer's, the professor at Harvard, Al Romer's um, office, there were drawers and drawers and drawers of Uriops, and I went through measuring them all. And one Uriops, and a diamond-shaped wound 
in the arm, a deep wound, a peculiar shaped weapon. It matched a dimetrodon canine tube. So we have forensic evidence that this happened. Uh, how often did it happen? Next slide. Um, this is one of the top predators from the late Permian, from the beds that Olson and many others sampled in South Africa. It's a Gorgon. Uh, it's got one big killer canine. Um, and it's often illustrated as being ugly and, and naked with no covering. I think that's wrong. I think the evidence now is that there was a revolution in the late Permian that the Texas Redbeds animals, some of them, evolved a fur covering. There is some fur in a fossil turd from this predator. It could have come from the predator or from its prey, which was a herbivore relative. But right now, this is the, the most talked about um, a uh, handful of crap. Uh, <laughs> they cost their hair in it. <laughs> they cost their hair in it. Next. This is a, a very good painting of a saber toothed gorgon, a direct descendant of Dimetrodon, the Dimetrodon family, uh, with a huge canine. It's the first saber toothed animal ever. And uh, it came from ancestors of Texas red beds. Predators next. Okay, um, to put things in context, let's start, say, oh, 1820, with paleontology, which is just beginning. Uh, the, the yellow guys, the age of mammals, was well represented. Mammoths and mastodons and saber tooth cats and hyenas and um, um, cave lions. This was well documented actually by 1790 by French paleontologists. So below it is the age of reptiles, so named by um, Professor Cuvier in Paris. A longer period, more complex. Um, Megalosaurus, the first dinosaur meat eater, good specimens have been found by uh, British and described in 1820. And there were plant-eating dinosaurs too, and the suggestion of Triassic dinosaurs so we knew the overall population of extinct critters for age of animals, age of reptiles, now <clears throat> go back to around 300 million. There were um, um, fossil fish beds in the Devonian age of fishes. In between, the guys there on red um, hadn't been found. There was a gap, a huge gap. What came before the age of reptiles? Hmm, interesting. Next. Next. This is Al Romer. I was his last student, one of his last students. He dearly loved Dimetrodon. On the door of his office was painted a picture of a Dimetrodon wearing a pith helmet, digging up a human skeleton. <laughs> he also named and painted many, many fossil animals. One from near Archer City, he named Stereophalodon, which was the big predator before Dimetrodon. There's only one good specimen. We should all go to the Archer City Bone Beds and work it. They used to have a museum, they lost it. And Larry McMurtry moved. Uh, next slide. This is really where the concepts uh, get, get focused. Uh, the very young Queen Victoria, and she was tiny uh, as a young, a young queen. She also loved animals. She started the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And the Prince Consort, Prince Albert, scientifically um, educated. A great book came out in the mid 1840s called The, the uh, uh, Relics of Creation. And it was a history of fossils and living animals put in the context of progress, progressive creation. These two people bought a copy and talked about it to each other in the evening. I'll tell you, this was a time of a wonderfully productive royal family. Um, and they brought in the young Professor Owen, paleontologist, British Museum, and he gave lectures and, and demonstrations to their two kids in the palace. And uh, Prince Albert 
persuaded one of his kids to take the trip all the way to South Africa to get a skull for a professor only. And then he went all the way down and did get the skull and came back up and it's on display in the, uh, the museum. Um, Owen worked his whole life for a museum building um, and hard work, but that was to the connection with the, um, the, the empress, the queen, and the uh, consort. He saw the museum building finally built uh, in the 1870s before he passed on to his reward. Anyway, these are the two great movers and shakers in the history of museums and the history of Museum Education, next time. Okay, now one thing they discussed was classes. Uh, <laughs> since the time of Aristotle, maybe before, nature was seen, was interpreted in classes, low classes, high classes. Eagles, birds are very high in class. If you cut into them in an anatomy class, you see a gigantic heart, bigger for its weight than ours. A fantastic system of lungs better than ours. Um, and there's 11,000 species of birds. This is a very high class. Next slide. And then there's our class. The uh, milk-bearing, uh, fuzzy outside mammalia. And uh, since the uh, royal family were mammals, um, they're rated even above birds. And uh, when did they show up? And there was already some disturbing news. In 1818, Dickie Megalosaur, Jurassic dinosaur, uh, prof professors at uh, Oxford found tiny, tiny jaws. They were undoubtedly fur balls. They were mammals. They're part of the highest class. But they were tiny. There was a variety of them, but they were all small. And the dominant animals were these high class reptiles. Main dinosaur. Yeah, interesting. Next slide. There are no lower, lower classes, of course. This is available in t shirt form. It's very popular. Very popular with Bronco fans. The, um, the lizards, the snakes, uh, are lower class. They were part of your anatomy class when you, when you did uh, uh, university. And you cut into a lizard, and the heart lungs are very small and very weak and can't pump blood one twentieth as powerful as a bird or a, a fur ball. Uh, the brain is very tiny. Uh, when kept as pets, they seem relatively unresponsive. Uh, I've been bitten more by lizards than any other class. <laughs> and many of the ocean-going extinct reptiles were considered some sort Oh, lizards, that's a low class, next slide. <laughs> and there's a, there's a sidebar here. The crocodiles were, were recognized as a lizard adjacent, but you cut into a crocodile or an alligator, the heart's pretty dang big. You divide into four good chambers, such as ours, and the lungs are pretty darn good. And there was already reports from alligator hunters in Louisiana that the, the alligator mom is a Dutiful mama, that's absolutely true. So you did have a higher class development within the lower class. That's cool. Next slide. And then there are the soccer hooligans. It's the lowest class, the amphibia, with tiny, tiny, tiny brains, and tiny, tiny lungs. And some of the salamander amphibians have no lungs at all, and appropriately they're called the lungless salamanders. Uh, but there are a lot of them, thousands and thousands of species. And British naturalists coming back from Costa Rica said, well, it's hopping with frogs. Uh, go down there. Next slide. OK. Now, a guy who came out of the Royal Navy serving as a naturalist on the HMS Rattlesnake, kind of like Darwin served on, on the Beagle, uh, Thomas Henry Huxley the oldest of the Huxley clan, and he was interested in the, the lowest class, the amphibians. He was the first to spend a decade and a half of his life looking at all the fossil amphibians. 
And some of them were rather spectacular, a thing called uh, uh, arthro, uh, we have nothing in here. Um, the big guy on the bottom is an embolomere and it's got saber teeth. It's the first saber toothed frogoid, or, or what I call FOK, friend of Kermit. <laughs> big, dangerous, swimming, uh, cut tooth uh, predator. And he, he described it and he found work on many other small and medium sized uh, amph amphibians, including a uh, guy standing on his head, Amphibamus. Very strong legs, uh, clearly terrestrial in habit as an adult. Uh, and he asked himself, self, how, which of these amphibians became a higher class, a reptile, <coughs> something that could lay eggs on land and not water, and uh, become active through its whole life on land? Which one here? And which, which frogoid became a mammal? And he, he decided it was one of this crowds. Next slide. Meanwhile, in, um, in London, as Professor Owen, the, the uh, genius behind the new British Museum, and he was doing the late Permian. Hardly anyone else was. He was doing the late Permian. And he was finding a menagerie of bizarre animals, some of which were quite huge. The one he's riding is Titanosuchus. It's an animal, probably a ton. The first animal I'm going to be a ton, and strong legs. And uh, the two tuskers, Dicynodon, that's the one that the royal prince brought back from South Africa. And there's a Gorgon there, um, which, had, which had been brought to, from South Africa too. There was a whole menagerie of animals. And Owen was careful when talking about evolution. He didn't want to scare people. But he suggested what he thought, what he believed, with the names. Like, uh, it was the weasel lizard. Uh, he would combine a, a low-class name, lizard, with a high-class name, a weasel. And he would do that with the wolf lizard, to Perio uh, Sucus, and uh, the Gorgon face. He was communicating subtly that there was a time when the low-class reptilness was being uh, overridden with a higher-class mammalness. And most of his colleagues either disregarded it or attacked him. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Owen, the great uh, anatomist, was a first-class jerk. <coughs> he would publicly attack people who were poorer less well endowed with funds, and unnecessarily attack uh, uh, colleagues, and he, he attacked the, the uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. But anyway, he was suggesting something that people were not getting. Next slide. Okay, this is a mounted one of Titanosuchus, one of Owen's weird animals, uh, a, what we call now male-like reptile, that's on exhibit in South Africa. That's a huge dude. That's a ton mm. of plant-eating um, sort of hybrid critter. Next slide. Okay, and if, if you do a modern reconstruction of some of these giant um, hybrid partial mammals, um, they're scary. These are both uh, nearly a ton. The one on the right is Antiosaurus, South Africa. Africa again, although its kind is all over the world. Um, and the one it's biting is a um, bonehead, uh, a uh, it's happening to aliens, which put thick lumps of, of bone over their brain for biting each other. Uh, and these guys ruled the world in the, in the next wave of change after the Texas Redback. This is the next wave. Next slide. Okay. Here is Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon was discovered in, in um, 1787, and uh, by 1884, there were a dozen skeletons of five different species, interesting guys, and they had a first tooth, first upper tooth, uh, uh, 
and the incisor, which is strong and circular and cross section. And then the more posterior teeth are compressed side to side and sawn edged for cutting things apart. Interesting guy. Plus, there's that hole behind the eye. That's an important hole. Next slide. That hole is, is what we often say, and we need a, uh, a uh, drum machine. That's the hole of destiny. <laughs> because you have it right behind, right in front of your ear. Place your finger gently right in front of your ear, behind your eye, and there's a depression. There's a hole. That hole is full of your jaw muscles. Now, I, at lunch, please practice chewing on something hard and then feel the muscle contracting. It's a hole. That hole is present in dogs and cats and, and cows and bats and okapis. Uh, name your favorite mammal. It's got the hole. What's your favorite mammal in Africa? Uh, naked dual mole rat. Excellent choice. <laughs> Very intelligent, lives underground, doesn't have hair, it's got the hole. Whales have that hole, everyone's got that hole. Um, to find the ultimate ancestor of the high class, you find the first animals with that hole. You find the first animals with that hole here. <laughs> it's called the lateral temporal fenestra. And it's here, and it was described by Professor Cole from Texas, Red Beds Animal. Next slide. Here's the lower jaw of a dimensionon. And uh, in the back, you see a notch, uh, you know, a funny notch in, in, the, in the jaw. You have that notch. It's inside your ear. That notch is the ectotympanic. It's holding your eardrum right now. The first animals to have the ectotympanic, the eardrum holder, are Texas redbeds animals, very early, early, early. Next slide. Okay. Um, Professor Cope was delighted with these holes of destiny and wrote about them eloquently. And unfortunately, for reasons I don't understand, um, most of his colleagues said, yeah, holes, schmoles. <laughs> they don't mean that much. Next slide. Well, um, dinosaurs had two big holes behind the eye, two, two holes. <coughs> Even as juveniles, they had two holes. And you can see that easily in the T Rex skeleton at, uh, at Whiteside. Next slide. Now, now there is an unfortunate um, detour. You have this story of the mammal hole in the side of the head and the mammal notch in the jaw for the eardrum, both being identified in Dimitridon and in skin from the fossils right here and nearby. So everyone should have said, oh, Mr. Yassau, who came from these red red animals. But then New Zealand intervenes. In New Zealand, there is one animal, this is its head, alive today, it's a living animal, the tuatara. Uh, the tuatara has uh, a skull, big eye, Notice that big hole right behind the eye, fine. But wait a minute, it's got an extra hole. You can see it, extra hole on the top of the skull. So it's a two hole. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very primitive in the rest of the skulls. So the scholars would say, we all must have come ultimately from a tuatara. Yeah, because that's the most primitive living uh, reptile. Next slide. Here's the top view of an early archosaur, a distantly related <coughs> contemporary animal. The, you can see the eye and the lateral hole, which we have, the mammal hole, and then the extra hole in the top. Well, T. rex is like that. So the little endangered species, the tuatara, was dissected and inspected and rejected and, and monographed, and there are beautiful books and pictures of the thing. Uh, and that led to a false conclusion that not only do we come from something like the Tuatara, but we come from something with two holes. Next slide. Now, 
This brings up a uh, delicate subject, because tuatara is lacking many things that adult reptiles have today. And when, to be brutally frank, and we, we, we tend to be that way, it is dickless. There is no male organ. It's not well hung, it's unhung. <laughs> And when the first naturalist pulled up a, a, uh, a sphenodon and cut into it, <laughs> the male, there was nothing there. So, all right, a new, a new modification to the theory. We evolved from um, reptiles that were laying eggs on land. Okay, they're that advanced, but small brains, which had not yet evolved a sophisticated, efficient way of using plumbing in reproduction. And I even heard that from Al Romer. Um, so this, this is my um, interpretation of a um, middle school uh, dimetricon, learning that <laughs> it's, it's outfitted like a uh, tuatara. <laughs> and though not widely published, this thing ruled for a century, so about six years ago, century. You cannot dissect a pickled uh, a lime to a tar, too rare to protect it. But you can dissect a pickled one, pickled way back in 1880. And that finally happened, including one up at, uh, up at Harvard. And when they dissected the male, okay, it was not equipped with obvious um, um, mature uh, apparatus, but there was a lump in the floor of the uh, Rear of the, the, the anatomy it was alone. And they sectioned the lump, it was full of cells that were dividing. One of the greatest mysteries, and I have no suggestion, is that the tuatara evolved from an ancestor that was fully equipped. And the male organ does develop to a certain part of uh, the anatomy. And uh, Stops. It just stops. It, and, and there's no more. That happens in songbirds, by the way. In 10,000 species of songbird, there is no um, penis. It's not. The argument is, well, it's dead weight, it's more important to fly. Um, the tuatara didn't fly. It doesn't fly. It never had a flying ancestor. Why the heck did it suppress um, the male organ? We don't know what it happened. Did the Mastodon go through this um, sequence? Next slide. This is the head from the top of the Mastodon. With the bones above the eye covered. Those bones are damn thick. These are the upper eyelid, upper eyebrow bones. They're like armor. They're really thick. And there is no upper hole. The guys were wrong. The theory was wrong for half a century. They were inventing a hole that doesn't exist. You have to stick a knife in the skull and move these skull bones around to make a fake upper hole. Interesting. And poor Professor Cope spent his whole life arguing against the phantom hole. You know, we, our ancestors have been one holers, proud one holers, for their entire life and are not are not close relatives of the dickless to a child. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, let's talk about the teeth. Uh, that big, strong fang up front and the cutting fang in the, in the rear. Next. Here is a jaw of a baby dimetrodon, uh, about a third grown, and it shows the killing fang and then a long row of cutting teeth. Next slide. And these teeth um, were replaced, were renewed all through life. Uh, the tooth socket was a factory of teeth, like the magazine of an old tubular rifle. New teeth were forming in the tooth socket, or when the, the functional tooth is broken or worn out, falls out, and it's another one. They never run out of teeth, ever. Most animals are like that, they're not like us. We have adult teeth, that's it. Nope, uh, Dimetrodon never ran out of teeth. New ones being produced in every tooth socket. 
And when the tooth is lost, when it's lost from the tooth, uh, the uh, jaw, we call it a bullet um, because it tells you who is feeding on whom. Next slide. Here's a T-Rex, the uh, jaw um, near the chin. You can see new teeth coming in and going in through the root of the functional teeth. This happened all through life, they never ran out. Um, one thing, when, what part of my crew's new tradition is to get on your hands and knees and pick up every shed tooth, because that's a bullet it had been used for feeding. Next slide. Now, we have done some stuff with fossil crocodiles and their shed teeth. Living crocodiles are sophisticated. The big males are separate from the breeding females and the babies, and you should find some segregation of shed teeth, and we do. We have several thousand Jurassic crocodile teeth, and by them, their society was like crocodiles. Uh, next slide. That's the inside of an Allosaurus jaw, showing the teeth growing in uh, through the socket. We've done the same thing with Allosaurus, we have several hundred shed Allosaurus teeth from Wyoming, and it looks like the babies and the adults were all feeding on the same thing. The babies weren't feeding on baby food, they were chewing on giant hunks of adult prey, much like uh, an eagle feeds on adult prey brought to the nest. Now, it looks like Allosaurus at least did that. Next slide. That is a baby, probably newborn, uh, dimension on tooth. Uh, that guy would be only a couple pounds tops. And you can see it's already serrated, it's very sharp. And that was found among chewed bones, right here in Seymour, chewed bones of various prey and shed teeth of adults. Circumstantial evidence that mom and, and or dad were feeding on the same food as their kids. Hmm. hmm, next slide. So this would work if you imagine that's mom there bringing home an Ariok steak for the kids for that evening. Next slide. Now, um, in one of our beds, in uh, some of you dug there uh, the other day, one of our beds, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of chewed up shark, freshwater shark, and they're occasionally shed teeth of Uryops, the big alligator-headed amphibian, that's the guy on the left. And with these uh, chewed up sharks, there are dimension on shed teeth. And there are thousands of chewed sharks in this bed, thousands. The dimension among other things, was feeding on the shark, the other white meat. Next slide. Next. What about the herbivores? Ecosystem has to have herbivores. We do find herbivores shed teeth. That's the uh, <coughs> teeth, front tooth, the diabetic is a big plant eater. And the museum has wonderful specimens. Uh, next slide. And we have more than shed teeth for diabetes. Um, one of our um, colleagues is attracted to really ornamental, instructive crap. And uh, he found these footprints, which are for diabetes, that broad feet, broad claws. And right next to it, next, was this wonderful piece of crap. Um, <laughs> that's herbivore crap, that's herbivore poo. In fact, there's a, there's a uh, poster you can sign away for, which will uh, allow you to classify your own poo. Mm. There's a whole system of vegans that, that um, they exchange pictures of poop. And this is the number six, by the way. <laughs> it's liquidy. It comes down in a ropey thing, not lumps, not dry, but not diarrhea. But it's number six. And I want all of you to try at least just tap on one number six and send us the picture. Anyway, <laughs> this wonderful poop. Could you back up one? Back up one. There. Those two diadectes planting in footprints were found right next to, okay, one forward, this number six. Uh, we were looking for a little table with a Sports Illustrated. Uh, but couldn't. 
This is one of the few cases where the footprints confirm the identity of the shitter. <laughs> so yes, there are things eating plants, and digesting plants, and processing plants, and pooping plants. But, here's a huge but, you may want to write this down, huge but. Although the herbivores existed and left footprints and left shed teeth and left a number six poo, they're incredibly rare here in Baylor County or the next county or the next county. Herbivores had evolved. Today, if you go to um, um, Africa, you expect to see maybe one lion for 50 uh, antelope and zebra. Overwhelmingly plant eaters. Here, and you can check out the uh, exhibits, it's the opposite of uh, way. There's 100 meteors to venture on per single tidectic. It's upside down. The ecological pyramid is upside down. And it's that way for about 10 million years. Next slide. That's the front end of dialectic with the broad guts for digesting uh, stuff. Next slide. So we have a dialectic. Chris dug a dialectic that had been bitten in the snout in the front, apparently pulled out of the ground by it's snapped. That is a very common scenario today in animals that hide in burrows. This is from uh, the White River Formation. That's an Oreodonda guy. The red guy is a plant eater, and it's a saber toothed cat and a burrowing uh, tortoise. Uh, if you're specialized to grabbing things by the snout and yanking them out, next slide, uh, you're going to produce a lot of bites in the head. If the, um, the red bone is the back of a Dimetrodon uh, skull, the brain case, and it's got bite marks in it. And there's a close-up of one of the parts of the brain case showing the bite. Uh, Dimetrodon was feeding upon Dimetrodon very heavily. The average Dimetrodon died and was chewed by other Dimetrodons. Next slide. Here is this famous diadectic Sutan exhibit where the whole front of the snout had been bitten and ripped off. Mm. The animal died, and the body pulled out of its burrow. Probably was a burrow uh, uh, hider. Next slide. Here is my favorite fossil in the in entire uh, uh, museum here. This is uh, Ashaloma, and as projected, it's about ten, it's five times natural size, about the size of a big woodchuck. As a tr it's an amphibian. Lowest class. Very strong legs. As an adult, it was living on land and probably in burrows. Next slide. Here is its snout. You see all the, the crush marks in the snout from the eye sockets? The crush marks are circles. Something with powerful circular teeth was biting the heck out of the snout and probably pulled the animal out of the ground with those bites. Next slide. Here's the close up of the bite. But this is a fabulous CSI. And those bite marks match that first big upper tooth of Dimetrodon, your ancestor. Next slide. Here is a uh, femur of a Dimetrodon. And see that bite? Mm. That lenticular bite mark that fits a posterior tooth of Dimetrodon. Next slide. Here is one of the R skeletons called Willie. And it's the entire tail had been bitten off, and there are bite marks there. Next slide. Here's a close-up of two uh, neck bones. These are the bones right behind the head. One, uh, two different species of dimension on. The one on the left had been bitten. There's lots of muscle in the neck, and some of them had bitten a lot of the next slide. Here is a lower shoulder bone, short You can see all the notches along the, the bottom edge. Nip, nip, bite, not bite, bite. Then all along the edge. That's what you do to remove a big hunk of muscle. Next slide. Here's a shoulder, and it's just the rear of the shoulder blade. The front, which is in blue here, has been bitten away. Next slide. Here is a baby dimension on a complete uh, upper arm bone on the left, and uh, another one on the right. Where both ends have been bitten off, leaving only these shafts. We call this the endless shaft, which we often get from 
government bureaus. Next slide. Here is a uh, very good, uh, slender, baby Dimetrodon humerus that's been bitten off of the top and the bottom of the side. Next slide. Here is a hip, and all of the little tiny arrows show bite, 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 bite. There's lots of muscle there. Well, the Dimetrodon is biting, not randomly, not, not very coarsely, but where it will get the most meat from each bite. Next slide. Here is another uh, hip. This is from a Cicadontosaurus. Uh, uh, there are massive bites on the bottom, and the top of the hip, little bites all around. Next slide. Oh, I love this one. This is the, the femur of a two thirds grown Dimetrodon, and the, the shaft and the lower end are pretty good. But the, up towards the top, the entire upper end, the joint end, has been bitten away. You can get the same effect with most dogs and a bone from the butchers. Dementia Don was a precision fighter, a precision excavator of me. Next slide. So, cannibalism sometimes strikes a, a disturbing note, but in fact, with our allosaur discoveries in Jurassic. The same thing. Most allosaurs were chewed up by other allosaurs. Uh, cannibalism is just intelligent recycling. And Mayans do it. Uh, hyenas do it. Uh, Lutherans do not do it. <laughs> <laughs> but Dimetrodons did this. Next slide. And it reciprocates. We talked to, I talked about the sharks being eaten by Dimetrodon. It ate sharks. It ate lots of freshwater sharks, lots of freshwater fish. And the sharks sometimes ate the Dimetrodon. It's a Dimetrodon thigh bone with long scrape uh, marks, which are classic shark um, uh, remnants. Next slide. Okay. <clears throat> so. We're beginning to be, we're halfway there to, to supply dimension on the food that is not herbivorous food. Uh, here's a boomerang head, and we love these guys, flat-headed amphibians. Next slide. Here's the growth uh, from once, from a little baby to half-grown and full-grown. The one on the top is the biggest one I know. Uh, and these guys are really common. Next slide. And they were bitten and pulled out. Next slide. Here is one. And on the left, you can see the snout has been bitten and animal killed with a snout bite. Next slide. Uh, that is the total body of a boomerang head that broke all this. Next slide. And they are found all through the channel deposits, the rivers. And most of them have been bitten by dimension on. Next slide. Okay. So the, the mystery of the missing plant eaters, I think it's solved. Uh, dimension on was designed and had the behavior and did it very efficiently to attack watery, non-marine prey. Um, the freshwater sharks, like these guys, and other freshwater fish. Bottom of the amphibians, like the boomerang head, big amphibians like Ariarchs, occasionally big herbivores, but it could survive without them. This system, this ecosystem, lasted about 12 million years. So the herbivores were just about irrelevant. Present, but irrelevant, like vegans in small towns in Wyoming. <laughs> Next slide. So, um, back to our guys, to um, Sir Richard Owen, the uh, paleontologist who gave lectures of, to the royal family and uh, got the royal family to support the building of the British Museum. Uh, and he accumulated a lot of late Permian critters uh, who, when compared with our early Permian, make a continuous uh, story. It begins here. Ecosystem first one was set up here, and then in finally in the late Permian, you had a normal one with 
thoughts of uh, her before. Anyway, um, that's the end of the tour. And uh, what you have done, and you, the people at Bailey County, have done supporting the museum is extraordinary. And what the museum people have done uh, is, is mind, mind boggling. And uh, is teaching the entire world something fundamental about our history. So I don't ask any of you to become the yet. <coughs> We're cannibals. But um, do go to the museum again and um, uh, tip your hat to our ancestral group, the Dimensionons of the Nuts, who made a living and a good one by feeding off aquatic prey and set up the evolutionary um, <coughs> Foundation for the great late Permian explosion that Professor Owen described with many herbivores. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>